Hi everyone, my name is Aneri Patani. I'm a senior correspondent with KFF Health News. I have been covering the opioid settlement money uh, for about a year and a half now. Prior to that, just more generally, my um, reporting areas are mental health and substance use. So this is uh, an area that I've been covering for a while and the money has been something that I'm really interested in. And I'm excited for all of you all to join today. Um, I know some of you have already been covering this topic. Um, hopefully others are, are interested in, in starting that. Uh, and so hopefully today I can give you some uh, tips that I've learned in the past year and a half and some resources to do so. So we're going to talk about how to track opioid settlement funds in your state. So this is uh, where I want to start is just show you all our landing page, um, kffhealthnews.org slash opioid settlements. And this is because um, this is the landing page that houses all the articles that um, my coworkers and I have done over the past uh, year and a half. It includes the various databases, um, several of which I'm going to show you today. It includes a localized this tip sheet that kind of walks through a lot of the things that I'm going to say today. So if at any point after you know, this presentation you're looking for these resources, this is a good place to start um, if you come back here. Now, I'm assuming a lot of you all joining today have some background about the opioid settlements. So just very briefly, I wanted to touch on the fact that uh, when we talk about opioid settlement money, it's actually money coming from many different companies, uh, companies that manufactured um, opioid prescription painkillers, uh, pharmaceutical distributors, as well as pharmacies like CVS, Walgreens, Walmart um, that, that gave out those prescriptions. Um, the money is coming in different amounts from each of these companies and over different timelines. So some are 18 year timelines, some are 10 years, some are five years, some are one time payments. Uh, I also want to mention that we often talk about more than $50 billion in opioid settlements are on the way. Some of these are already paying out but not all of them. So Purdue Pharma, which is very well known as the maker of OxyContin, actually has not begun paying yet because their case is um, being held at the Supreme Court for review. So that number includes them and, and folks are expecting that payment to come through, but it's not actually happening yet. Um, so it's a, it's a complicated landscape, but I just wanted to set our basis there with when we talk about this money, it's coming from a lot of different places over varying timelines. So that kind of leads us to the important question of if, you know, we know $50 billion over an 18 year period, um, that's great. And that's, you know, one big headline. But how do you know what your city or county or state has in hand today? Because if you want to actually track and follow the money, that's the crucial question, right? What do, what do my local officials have right now that they could be spending and what are they doing with it? Uh, and what we found is that a lot of um, attorneys general offices will uh, put out you know, press releases saying how much money the state has won over a long time period, but it's really difficult to know at the local level. So we, what we did um, at KFF Health News is reach out to, there's a firm uh, appointed by the courts to administer the settlements. They're called Brown Greer. And basically what they do is they take the money from the companies that are paying out and then they give it out to local governments, to state governments, et cetera. And so because there is sort of the conduit, they know how much money has been paid or, and how much is left to be paid, and they keep track of that. So we were able to get that information from them and then transform it into a usable database for um, everyone else to use. And so this is our local payouts database that was just published um, last week. And I'm actually gonna click out of the presentation to show you quickly um, what it looks like to use it. So I'm going to um, scroll right now past the you know, beginning brief, but I highly recommend reading this before you use the data because it has important context about what this information does and does not include. Um, the biggest thing being um, this payout information captures the four companies that are paying the most in opioid settlements. But as I said, there are many different companies paying. And so this is likely an undercount. More companies will begin paying in the future and states will likely get more money. Um, but for now, this is uh, some of the most uh, comprehensive national level data we have. So here you can see all the states. It tells you um, how much money has been received already. So this is how much is in the hands of local uh, of officials across the state to be able to spend. And on the estimated future payout is how much is expected in future years because the payouts um, come over many years. 
So uh, if you'll notice Alabama says NA, and again, that's explained in the article text leading up to this database, but essentially there are some states that did not join the national settlements. They settled independently um, with some of these companies. So they are getting money, but because they weren't part of the national settlement, they're not paid through the administrator and therefore we don't have their data. Um, but I want to show you that in addition to the state level, what's really great here is that um, when you click on a particular state, let's say California, you get the year by year breakdown of how much um, has been received all across the state. But then you can click on the localities tab and actually see other places. So let's say I want to look for San Francisco. I can now see how much money San Francisco has to date and how much they're expecting in future years. And then if I click on them, I can also get the year by year breakdown of the money they've received or are expecting. So going back here, oops. Um, this is basically helping you answer that very first question. When you have this database, you can look up your community or the various counties in your coverage area and say, how much money has been received? Then you kind of go to the elected officials and ask the crucial question of, I know you have X dollars in hand. Have you spent it? What have you done with it? And the great thing is kind of regardless of what they say, it's a story. So if they say yes, you ask, you know, what did you spend it on? Is that an allowable use? And I'll talk about allowable uses in a second. Um, how will this spending of the money help the addiction crisis? Who was involved in the decision making? Did they report how they spent the money publicly? And if not, why not? And how are they going to measure or know if using the money this way was effective and worked? And are they going to keep using the money that way in future years? So you have like several different stories that can come from that. At the same time, if they say, no, we haven't actually spent any of this yet, that in itself can be a story. You know, why not? Some of these payments began arriving in 2022. It's now 2024. Why haven't they spent it? What are their plans? Who's involved in making those plans? Um, will they re be reporting publicly how they spend it when, when that happens? And are they in sync with other communities around them in terms of is everyone sort of waiting and, and developing plans to spend it? Or have other places sort of planned ahead and, and gotten money out the door and this community is sort of an outlier? So hopefully the database gets you that first question so then you can get to all these other stories. So some context to give you for um, stories you might pursue. Um, one is the allowable uses thing um, I mentioned. So most of the settlement agreements have this requirement that each state must use at least 85% of the funds for quote, opioid remediation. And this is a term that generally means things related to the opioid crisis, whether that's um, prevention, treatment, recovery, harm reduction, et cetera. They try to define it a little further in Exhibit E, which is uh, attached at the end of settlement agreements. And Exhibit E is essentially a list of over 100 suggested interventions. And these interventions are things like buying naloxone, often known by the brand name Narcan, um, investing in recovery housing, uh, helping people who are uninsured get treatment. Uh, but there are two things about Exhibit E. One, it's not exhaustive. So that means states and local governments do not have to choose from this list. They can spend opioid settlement money in ways other than what is on this list, as long as they think it qualifies as opioid remediation. Secondly, the list itself, the items on it are sometimes pretty vague or broad. It'll say things like increased treatment for um, people who are pregnant or, or parents uh, and have opioid use disorder. Well, there's a number of different ways you could meet that goal. And the reason it's vague is because it's one list for every city, every county, every state receiving money across the country. And so the folks who are creating it wanted it to be flexible enough that places with different in infrastructure, different goals, different um, abilities would be able to use the list. However, the flip side of sort of the flexibility is uh, interpretability. And so in just my reporting so far, I've seen uh, some places come to very different interpretations of what this list means. So for example, um, there are some uh, items on the list that have to do with uh, aiding people with uh, substance use disorders in jails uh, and prisons, people who are incarcerated. And when I was doing some reporting in Michigan, there were a few counties that said, well, we're going to use our opioid settlement funds to buy 
body scanners for our jails so that people coming into the jail are scanned. If they've hidden any drugs on them, these scanners will be able to spot it and therefore we will keep the drugs out of our jail and protect populations um, who are vulnerable inside. And there are some counties that went ahead and spent money on that. And then there were other counties who were considering the same exact use, but said, I don't, their, their county attorneys basically told them, this is not an allowable use. They're looking at the same exact document, but they're coming to different conclusions. Second piece I wanna talk about in terms of context is enforcement or oversight. So when it comes to that, you know, states must spend at least 85% of the funds on opioid remediation, what happens if they don't? At the national level, in the settlement agreements, this is the one sort of paragraph that deals with it. And what you see on the screen is, you know, wonky legalese, but essentially what it means is that the companies that are settling, if they believe a state has not met that threshold, they can take the state back to court and try to reduce the amount of money they're going to pay in future years. So it's the settling companies that are sort of in charge of the enforcement. Fortunately, unfortunately, from speaking with uh, legal experts and, and other folks uh, who are monitoring this, they think it's kind of unlikely that uh, companies will do that because it takes them a lot of time and effort to monitor how a state is spending the money if it meets the threshold. And then if they take them back to court, it generates news coverage um, that talks about the company's role in the, in the overdose crisis. So a lot of people say, you know, this level of enforcement is probably weak or not going to be used a lot. So that kind of creates a natural space for journalists, right? We can be the watchdog. We can be um, doing accountability stories and, and seeing how this money is used. And so to do so, I want to share with you all some resources that hopefully will make this a little easier. Uh, the first is, uh, I had mentioned this earlier, but we have a localized this tip sheet that is sort of a written version of what I'm saying to you all right now. Um, so it's a great place to go back and reference. It has links to pretty much everything that I'm going to talk to you about. And again, you can find this on our landing page, which is kffhealthnews.org slash opioid settlements. One of the things um, that the Localize This uh, sheet links to is a database that talks about opioid settlement councils. So, uh, Several of my colleagues and I, along with folks at Johns Hopkins and the nonprofit Chatterproof, uh, tried to figure out um, the or gathered the names of everyone who is sitting on an opioid settlement council. There are 38 states in D.C. where these councils um, decide how the money is used or advise how the money should be used. And we gathered those names as well as their the individual's titles or fields so that we could then say, you know, which voices are over or underrepresented on every council. And you can look at your state and say, you know, which are the most prominent voices on my council and how might that affect the conversations had about this money or the decisions made about priorities and where it's used. For example, in this um, uh, one on the screen, you can see in Texas, there's a high percentage of medical and social service providers. That's this dark green area. Um, versus uh, you don't see it on the on the screen, but Tennessee um, I know has roughly you know 40 to 50 percent of their council is law enforcement and criminal justice. And so how might they think about this money differently? The one caveat I do want to mention is that this council database was created last year. And so um, some of the members may have changed. So this is a great place to start, but then um, you should double check your state as well. Uh, another database I want to mention is um, Public Reporting Promises. So this is work that we had done with uh, Christine Minhe, who's the founder of OpioidSettlementTracker.com, a website I'll talk about more in a second. Um, but she basically looked through legal documents from all the states to see what states have to report about how they spend this money. So in some states, local governments are required to publish a report about how they spend it. In some states, the council is, but the state agency isn't. Um, so you can use this map to see how transparent your state is or is not. And if you click on your particular state, it brings up this card like you see here for Maine um, that gives you more information about you know, who controls the money, which companies they're settling with, et cetera. All right, four other websites I want to um, tell you about super quickly. Uh, first is opioidsettlementtracker.com. That's the website from Christine Minhe that I just um, mentioned. This is probably one of my go-to resources um, to learn about the settlement. She breaks down how much money each state will receive from different companies. 
um, she gives you the total over 18 years. So you can kind of use our database to get how much do they have in each year and have they received already? And you can use hers to see how much um, are you supposed to get over the 18 year period. Uh, she also explains how each state has split the money between different state bodies, local governments, councils, et cetera. And she has a great um, tool called an expenditure tracker where she's been trying to collect links anywhere a state or local government has published um, online their report about how they're using the money. She tries to gather it there. So it's a good place to start looking at what has your state put out publicly. Below that, nationalopioidsettlement.com um, is the official uh, website of the Plaintiff Executive Committee. Honestly, I find it less useful than opioidsettlementtracker.com, but it's a great place to go for uh, the official settlement documents. Um, they have FAQs, things like that. In the uh, upper right hand, reportingonaddiction.org, uh, this is a website that just has great guidelines in general for accurately and responsibly covering the topic of addiction. Um, so regardless of whether you're doing opioid settlement stuff, it's useful for that. But they do have a specific tab for opioid settlement information where they've had webinars um, very similar to this one with uh, you know experts um, in tracking the opioid settlements. Reporters uh, talk about how they do it and give resources. They have a database of expert sources who have agreed to speak with reporters on this topic. So if you're looking for someone for your article, it's a good place to go. And they also have a Slack channel. Um, specific to people covering the opioid settlements where I and other reporters will share our stories, ask questions, share ideas. Um, it's a nice place to have some community. And then the final resource, um, AppalachiaOpioidRemediation.org. Um, uh, this is a website run by a nonprofit called Community Education Group. Uh, as the name suggests, it is specific to Appalachia, but they do do it from New York to Alabama. And what this group does is essentially track how opioid settlement money is spent. They go into county meeting minutes for every Appalachian county. And if there's a reference to opioid settlements, they pull it out and put it into their database, which then you can search. So it is a really wonderful um, resource, especially if you are reporting on those areas. They also have a weekly newsletter that you can sign up for. So um, obviously there is already a lot of coverage happening on this. I wanna share a little bit to give you some ideas. So just uh, as a national reporter covering this topic, I've had two different approaches. One is honing in on a particular locality that is doing something and reporting on that. So the first example you see here is Greene County, Tennessee. Uh, this is a place where we learned that millions of dollars from the opioid settlement funds were used to pay off the county's debt and shore up their capital projects fund. And what they then bought out of the capital projects fund was a pickup truck so that uh, they could transport people from the jail to the side of the road to pick up litter. Um, and as you can imagine, there were a lot of folks in the community who were questioning how exactly that qualified as uh, opioid remediation. The second story here is about Mendocino County in California uh, that decided to use a certain amount of settlement funds that year and every year moving forward uh, to plug their budget gap. Uh, and this was legal, it was um, you know, allowable, but it was uh, also causing a lot of um, questions in the, in the community. The other approach that I've uh, taken is looking at themes in spending because um, there are lots of places that are spending this money in similar ways. And so there are um, broader themes to, to break down. The first uh, that you see on the slide here is using money for youth prevention programs, where we found a lot of people seem to agree if we can prevent kids from developing substance use disorders in the first place, that would be great. However, how they approach it varies widely. There are some people who uh, favor DARE, which is the program where you know police officers go into schools and talk to kids about uh, the dangers of drugs or staying away from them. And there's been a lot of research that shows that program was not effective, um, but money is still going towards it versus others who say, you know, there are different uh, prevention programs with more evidence behind them. Why don't we put this money there? Another theme that has come up all across the country is using opioid settlement money for law enforcement and criminal justice initiatives. So the body scanners for the jails that I mentioned, um, squad cars for police, uh, canines for uh, police units. And we sort of dug into why communities wanted to spend the money this way, uh, what research says about it, and what the critics say about it. Okay. Uh, and then I also wanted to share just a few. I'm not even going to scratch the surface of there's so many great uh, local reporters already covering this, but I wanted to share a few examples that had been on my radar 
Um, so at the Atlanta Journal Constitution, actually very recently using our new local payouts database, they wrote um, a front page story about how much opioid settlement money is already in Georgia and how much is expected for the future. And I know since then that reporter has done another story about the settlement council being picked in Georgia. So it kind of, you know, once they had the first one, the other stories continue rolling. On the right hand side, you see a story from Spotlight PA, um, which is a Pennsylvania outlet that has done a lot of coverage of the opioid settlement money. This is one of their early stories looking at um, that theme I mentioned about money going to law enforcement uh, and how that uh, has caused some tensions in the communities there. Uh, here you see a story from the Maine Monitor, which has done a lot of great work. This is one of their stories that focused on a particular county and how that county is spending money. Um, but there are also, uh, Maine has done coverage about how there's a recovery council um, that is overseeing a lot of the settlement money uh, in the state and how they're moving slowly, which you kind of see a theme echoed by the Bridge Michigan coverage where they found millions of settlement dollars are already in the state but they haven't gone out, even as you know, people, providers um, for addiction treatment, people in recovery say they could urgently use the money, harm reduction services say they could use it, but it hasn't made its way out into the community yet. And they did a story about that. So those are just um, a few of the examples. Like I said, uh, there are so many great ones out there. And I'm, I know some of the folks who are working on this are on this call uh, and I hope you'll chime in. Um, but these are just my ideas of why you should cover the opioid settlements and join all this great coverage. Uh, so the biggest thing is, this is a lot of money. It's billions of dollars flowing over 18 years with very little oversight. And so it's just sort of naturally made for watchdog reporting. At the same time, we know that more than 100,000 Americans died of drug overdoses in the past year. So the need for this money is urgent. The public health crisis is urgent. Uh, most communities have been affected by this, so people care. People care about what happens to this money and if it's used effectively or not. Thirdly, the money is controlled by states, counties, and cities. It is not a federal money, right? These are agreements with states and counties and cities. So it's like your local officials, wherever you live, whatever you're covering, they are probably getting some of this money and having to make decisions about it. So it's an inherently local story. Uh, and lastly, we didn't talk about this much, but the Tobacco settlement of the 1990s uh, showed that a lot of the money that we got from cigarette companies did not go towards smoking cessation and prevention. So the risk of misuse is high, and there's a reason that there, you know, should be um, there. There's a reason that people are skeptical and wanting more coverage and wanting more accountability. So I hope that uh, this has given you some tools and some inspiration to join reporting on this big money story, this big public health story, this big government accountability story. And with that, I will, I will end. Um, I'm going to allow, I'll stop sharing my screen in a second. Uh, I wanna give folks a minute to write down my email if it's helpful. Um, like I said, I've been covering this for some time now. Uh, I love seeing more reporters um, covering it and I'm happy to help if I can. So thank you all for taking the time to join, really appreciate it. Mm -hmm.